Bands like Neck Deep face this problem. They launch their careers sporting a pop punk sound and then realize they have musical interests expanding far beyond the genre. This is the breaking point for most pop punk bands. Because they want to explore other sounds, but feel an obligation to keep delivering their original sound to their audience. Bands who do this never fully commit to keeping their original sound intact, but they also never fully commit to the new direction they want to take their band. This leaves bands a few options. They can continue making the same album over and over again to please fans, commit to a popular direction to unlock a new demographic, or attempt to explore and progress the genre forward. Each of these three scenarios are viable options and can work very well if done right, but few bands are capable of pulling this off. This is why pop punk bands often have a short shelf life, which might sound mean, but think about it like this. In your head, picture as many 2010s pop punk bands as you can. Now pick out all of the ones that would still be considered relevant or giants within the genre, or even just still making music. A decent handful, right? Now picture every pop punk band from the 2010s that are no longer relevant or giants within the genre. There are a lot. Today we'll be exploring how Neck Deep surpassed pop punk as a genre and a culture, and the steps they took to achieve this. So how has Neck Deep managed to stay relevant for so long? Not only relevant, but growing incessantly, while developing an enraptured fanbase. Because during their rise, they broke the cardinal rule of pop punk, at least to devoted fans of the genre anyway. And that rule is, don't nudge your sound in a popular direction. People who look like this hate that more than anything. In order to understand how Neck Deep was able to excel far beyond their peers, we're going to go back about six years. We're going to start by looking at their first LP, Wishful Thinking. This album came out January 2014, shortly after Neck Deep signed to Hopeless Records. The album came off the back of two highly successful EPs, Rain in July and A History of Bad Decisions, the first of which I discovered on Tumblr in late 2012. Therefore, when the album was released, they already had a ravenous, devoted group of Tumblr kids ready to devour its contents. I was one of them. Wishful thinking can best be described as generic pop punk, a phrase Neck Deep used to proudly plaster on their merchandise. It was more of a joke than anything, like how real friends made the pop punk suck shirts back in the day. But at its core, wishful thinking did feel generic. It's by no means a bad album, but it would come to feel like child's play compared to their following effort. This is the album that changed Neck Deep's career forever. And not for the reason you may think. Life's Not Out To Get You is legitimately one of the best pop punk albums of the last decade, at least in the top 10. But what's interesting is when a band releases an album so fantastic, so highly regarded, it actually puts them in an odd position, maybe even an uncomfortable one, because they have to follow it up. This is where most bands falter and ultimately break because they have a lot of big decisions to make. But I believe Neck Deep not only made the right decision, but the best possible decision they could have made following their career post Life's Not Out To Get You era. They were thinking 10 steps ahead into the future, and it paid off. Because when Life's Not Out To Get You came out, Neck Deep were a fixture within the world of pop punk. They were known in the scene, they toured with other pop punk bands, had merch that said this on it, they were so pop punk. But they quickly realized something. Instead of operating within a machine, you can just be the machine. And you can build all the special parts and gears that are unique to your machine that you built. A move like this can be risky, respectfully and slowly separating yourself from the scene you were birthed from. But it's paid dividends tenfold for Neck Deep. And that's not to say they're no longer popular in the world of pop punk, or that any members have any personal qualms against the genre or culture. The point is that their scope and reach extends so far beyond that world that I'd argue at this point, pop punk kids are now a fraction of their audience, especially based on the material they're releasing now.
warmed up fans by releasing two new singles at once, both of which didn't stray too far from Life's Not Out To Get You. But right off the bat you notice a couple things. The songs sound bigger, they sound huge, like they're meant to be played in a 25k cap arena, with everyone singing along and drinking really overpriced beer. And next, you notice less of a punk tone to Ben's voice. It sounds polished to perfection, eschewing the brashness and opting for a cleaner output to suit their new material. When the Peace and the Panic came out, here's how it felt. This is the general vibe I got from It and Neck Deep. It was their way of saying, hey, we're doing our own thing now, and we're gonna be huge. And the confidence behind this move was palpable, and I could tell there was no front. They had a vision, they knew what they were doing, and look at them just a few years later. If your band has nearly 1.5 million monthly Spotify listeners, you've made it. Not in the sense that life will be easy and that you'll never have to worry about money or anything like that, but in the sense that you've become your own entity. When they began, people knew them as Neck Deep, the pop punk band. But now, people just know them as Neck Deep, a band that can stand on its own without having to be tied to a specific genre or culture to receive consistent, high traffic. They are truly their own brand now. And whoever has been working with them behind the scenes these past few years deserves a large pat on the back. The transformation they've made doesn't happen overnight, and it takes a team of many dedicated individuals to realize this goal. That again, makes it all kind of worth it. And you know, you can be at this crossroads and you can think, oh, just pack it all in. I could have a much simpler life if I wanted to, but something will happen and you'll go, nah, this is what it's all about. This is what I love doing, you know? Um, yeah. So now we're in 2020 and Neck Deep is the biggest they've ever been before releasing an album. All Distortions Are Intentional comes out July 24th. And there's really only one question. Is it any good? Does it suck? Well, I have to redact my previous statements because this album is an abysmal steaming pile of old shoes? No. It's actually a great album that I enjoy. But let me be perfectly candid about my experience with it. After the first listen, I was like, yeah, I enjoy this overall. However, every subsequent listen has been followed by more and more love I developed for the record. I don't know what they're on with this album or who they're working with, but I swear they're doing secret tricks. Because certain hooks and choruses will just start looping in my head and I don't even know what song it's from. And on top of that, I didn't even know I remembered that certain hook or a chorus until it started playing in my head. But all jokes aside, I'd argue that the reason for this is likely witchcraft or good songwriting. One of the two. So All Distortions is a concept album, and if you're anything like me, you hear the term concept album and are almost scared. Because you know it's going to be really good or really bad, but you don't know yet. There's an easy way to know if a concept album is bad, and you can determine this by asking yourself, does it still stand even if you're unaware of the concepts, ideas, and stories within the album? If so, then at the very least, it's not terrible. A good concept album to me is one where I can enjoy the music first, then explore every other nook and cranny if I want to. Because if you're required to know background information and facts about band members' lives to appreciate the album, its audience is limited to people who already know about the band, making the album less than accessible and difficult to reach a new fan base. Listening to a concept album where you're required to know information before going in just feels like the band is giving you homework. And good bands don't give you homework. They give you great music. Sunshine. So the album's story revolves around this dude named Jet, who's a loner, who lives in this place called Sonderland. It's a combination of Wonderland and the word Sonder, which is apparently an obscure word that means every random passerby is living a life as vivid and complex as your own, with their own ambitions and worries. And even though these stories are told through characters, it's still reflective of the lives that each member of Neck Deep have lived. I hope they discuss the stories and characters more in depth after the album comes out, because I'd love to know more about the process of developing these characters and narratives, and what inspired them to craft this album in the way they did. We've come so far, so far from where we were before, and we were While simple, these lines couldn't be more apt in describing this album, even from their previous effort to this. 
I can't name a band who started playing pop punk and has had this intense of a transformation. I'm not sure how they've done it, but they've cultivated an audience that seemingly loves everything they put out and is willing to support them to the nth degree. And I'm definitely part of that fan base. Whatever they do in the future, I'll always be willing to check out and support. Because even if I'm not a fan, it feels good to know that their eyes are always tilted toward progression. The genuine love and passion I sense from each member is immeasurable. You can see in their eyes how much they love what they do and how thankful they are to be where they are. I wish them the best and hope they're 10 times as successful this time next year. Thank you for watching.